Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes, boa tarde, and welcome to everyone in attendance today. Welcome to our Global Perspectives on Race and Racism speaker series. My name is Dr. Jaira J. Harrington, Assistant Professor in the Black Studies Department at UIC, and I will serve as moderator for today's talk, Democracy and Higher Education Equity, the Black Student Movement and Affirmative Action by Professor Roger Richer. Here's the rundown of today's schedule. First, I will provide some background about the series. Second, I will introduce you to our speaker. He will share his presentation. And last, we will have open Q&A where comments in the chat will be acknowledged. And you can also raise your hand so that you can dialogue with our guests directly. And then we'll close for the afternoon. Before we begin, I would like to offer some background about the series. With support from the programming committees in the departments of Latin American and Latino studies, sociology, global Asian studies, and gender and women's studies, the Department of Black Studies will host the Global Perspectives on Race and Racism speaker series for fall 2023. This interdisciplinary series features scholars with expertise across the world to address the global socio-historical, economic, and systemic effects of racism. These events will provide multiple perspectives through which participants can explore the global dynamics of racism. We will see that the phenomena of race not only intersect with citizenship, belonging, and constructs of the nation state, they also commingle with class, gender, sexuality, and ability. This series will highlight race and racism from a variety of disciplinary perspectives and geographic contexts. Today's speaker is Roger Richer. Professor Richer is a PhD candidate and master's degree holder in the political science discipline at the State University of Campinas, Unicampi, with a degree in social sciences at the Federal University of Bahia, USBA. In 2021, he received the following awards. Best article in the Luisa Bajos Award from the Association of Postgraduate Studies and Research in Social Sciences, ANPOX, an honorable mention in the Lelia Gonzalez Award from the Brazilian Association of Political Science. His research covers topics of the following nature, race relations, public policy, and political participation. The floor is yours, Professor Richer, and we look forward to your presentation. Hello, guys. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for Professor Dr. Jaira Harrington to invite me for this event. And I will share my screen to, to talk about my research topic. So just a minute. Can you see? OK. Yeah. So um, the theme, theme of my presentation is um, democracy and higher education equity, the Black student movement and affirmative action. I'm from Brazil, so um, it's a pleasure to, to talk about this topic to for a people who don't live in my country. And uh, by doing this, we can understand the patterns of racial inequalities, not only in Brazil, but also around the world, especially in the higher education. So um, my research analyzes the contribution of the Black student movement in the construction of affirmative action in higher education between the years 1993 to 2024. So my study will examine how Black students contributed to approving and defending these initiatives in Brazil. So my research question is, what is the place of the Black student movement in supporting affirmative policies in Brazil? I'm doing this research at the State University of Campinas in my PhD studies. And I, I use not only qualitative approach, but also quantitative in my, my research. And so the methodology that I'm, that I'm, that I'm using is um, qualitative analysis through techniques, including close reading and analyzing documents and conducting semi-structured in interviews. And also I adopt, 
adopts quantitative methods by statistical analysis of the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics databases, such as the demographic census. And here, I would like to talk a little bit more the main results of my research. So first of all, I will talk about the national events related to the participation of black students at universities. So in 1993, the first seminar for black university students, as we talk in Brazil, Senum, was held at the Federal University of Bahia. It was the first national event aimed exclusively at the at black university students in Brazil. After Senum, other relevant events took place, such as the meeting of black students and cotas holders of the National Student Union, and UNI, as we, we talk in Brazil, which began in 2007 and had its last meeting in 2021. And the meeting of black university students and collectives, ECUM, which took place in 2016 at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Such events have as common characteristics the defense of a more inclusive education for black students. So here there are some images. The first one is about Senum. And here we can see a phrase that means university, the university that black people want. So this it was the first event aimed exclusively to the black students, um, Afro-Brazilians. And here um, is an image about Enuni, which took place in Salvador, Bahia in 2016. And here um, is a phrase that means achieve your rights and fight against racism. And in this picture, we can see a poster of Ekun. So here there are some images related to the national events. So in the first picture, we can see a place where um, there are lots of uh, black university students. And here we can see the mobilization, the potential of, of mobilization of black social movement at universities in Brazil. And in the second picture, we see a protest uh, which took place in Salvador um, after the realization of the Enuni. And there are lots of people fighting for, for example, the improvement of affirmative action in higher education, but not only uh, fighting for um, uh, equity at universities, but also fighting against um, violence that black people suffer in our country. So both pictures are very representative um, about the, the power of the black social movement at universities um, related to their mobilization. And now I would like to talk a little bit more the preparatory courses. Um, the claims around affirmative action policies emerged in the context of the 1990s gaining more repercussion in the 2000s. For example, it was in 1990s that the Steve Biko Cultural Institute emerged, a preparatory course for college entrance exams that aims to train black students to enter public universities. And in Brazil, public universities are institutions that historically present, presented a picture of the underrepresentation of black people. And researchers such as Flavia Rios points to popular prep courses as one factor responsible for building affirmative action in the country. So the, prepar the preparatory courses was and is very important to the implementation of affirmative actions in Brazil. Um, and I would like to talk um, about the Instituto Cultural Estive Bico. Um, it is a preparatory course very important in, in our country. So in the first picture, we see um, lots of students and of the Instituto Cultural Estive Bico. And in the second picture, we can see a poster, um, which, uh, and we see a phrase, which uh, that means um, providing affirmative action in Brazil, uh, 25 years providing affirmative actions. And in the last picture, we see a phrase that means universities, 
University for All, Racism for None. And this institution is very important to the, the, the history of affirmative action in, in our country. And now I will talk about the international and national context where the uh, affirmative actions um, was developed in our country. So the Durban Conference in 2001 in South Africa is seen as essential for Brazil to adopt affirmative action. Due to this event, the Brazilian government, led by Fernando Henrique Cardoso, um, our former president in Brazil, um, created the national program of affirmative actions in 2002 and adopted affirmative actions in the ministries of justice, agrarian development, and foreign affairs. And in the state level in 2003, the State University of Rio de Janeiro adopted racial quotas to rule state law number 4151. And the State University of Bahia is also considered one of the pioneers implementing quotas, which adopted the policy in 2002. However, affirmative policies deepening nationally in the government led by the Workers' Party, because um, in this context, the social movements, not only black social movements, but also feminism and other relevant um, social movements um, encountered um, find in Brazil a context where um, the social movements, the participation uh, was more, um, how can I say it in English, more uh, amenable for the demands of these groups. So um, it was very, very important to deepen, for example, public policies related to um, racial issues and etc. So um, based on the pressures led by the black movements in the country, the Workers' Party um, governments were responsible for building the Special Secretariat for Policies for the Promotion of Racial Equality in 2003, creating a national climate more amenable to the demands of these groups. In addition, several universities such as UFBA in 2004 and University of Brasilia in 2003 began to implement affirmative policies. However, it was from 2012 onwards that this policy gained national uniformity to rule law 12711, popular known as the Cotas Law. So the pressures um, related to the democratization of higher education was uh, very important to the implementation, the construction of the Cotas Law in Brazil. And now I would like to talk a little bit more the underrepresentation of, of the Black population in higher education. So the underrepresentation of Black students in higher education has always been striking in Brazilian society. Despite the idea that Brazil has a supposed racial democracy, that is, the comprehension that racism does not exist in the country because the national population is mostly mixed, according to this myth, the portrait of the student composition in the universities demonstrates the low percentages of Blacks in these institutions, Black population in these institutions. According to the researcher Marcia Lima, in 1991, the presence of Black students in higher education was negligible, 2.5%. However, after adopting affirmative action in the 2000s, the picture change it greatly with an increase of 58.2% in the presence of black students in higher education institutions in 2010. And in addition, um, it is possible to observe the self-organization of black students, which the primary object of making higher education more diverse and democratic. It can be seen when black students organized themselves into student, co student collectives, black collectives, built initiatives such as the popular courses and organized seminars and national meetings. And we can observe that black students articulate with various organizations of the black and student movements. 
And these interactions made us formulate the idea that the actions of black students in favor of the democratization of higher education can be configured in a social movement with its characteristics. In this sense, I intend to develop throughout my PhD research the idea of a black student movement located in the intersection between the movements mentioned above. It is an idea that, that I am developing. I've been developing my research thesis. And um, before the 1990s, the student movement was thought only in the singular because um, it was not common to see lots of black students in the um, student movement. Um, there, there are many um, white students. It's not common to see before the 1990s lots of black students uh, in the universities, in social in the student movements. And, and the universalist paradigm of class ignored gender and racial differences. After all, the leadership of the student movement followed a logic that disregarded the context of racial inequalities in Brazil. And after the 1990s, however, it is possible to observe the construction of initiatives that make the traditional student movement more inclusive. For example, in 1991, as I said before, the first Senu took place. In 1995, the UNI elected its first black president. UNI is um, the representative entity in Brazil that, about the students at universities. In 1997, the plenary of black students present at the UNI Congress defended racial quotas in universities. And in 1999, the same entity created the Directorate of Anti-Racist Anti -racist Affairs. All these initiatives had as their most evident characteristics, the demand for the democratization of higher education for, for the black population in Brazil. And here, I would like to share some images about the presidents of the UNI. The first black president in the UNI was Orlando Silva in 1995, and UNI was founded in 1937. So only in 1995, we, we have um, a black president in the UNI. And in the second picture um, is Bruna Brelais. She was our first president of the UNI in 2021, 2021. He, uh, she was elected in a Congress, and Manuela Mirella is our um, current president of the UNI in 2023. So um, we, we see um, the changes in the, the composition of the student movement in Brazil, and I agree that um, these changes was influenced by the Cotas Law, the black social movements at universities, etc. In addition to observing anti-racist claims, the student movement also incorporated the inclusion of women and LGBTQIA plus people among its agendas. In this sense, in my master's degree thesis, I identified that in the 2000s, UNI also started building the meetings of women students as we, we talk in Brazil, EMI, as we say, in 2005, and LGBT student meetings in 2015. So these transformations impacted the reconfiguration of the collective identity of the student movement, which since then began to question the idea of a universal students, creating conditions for the term student to be said in the plural. So here we see um, a poster about Amy, and we see lots of um, black women in the leadership of the feminism in Brazil. And there is a, a phrase that means the feminism culture changing the Brazil. And here we see lots of people in an auditorium and in the in a in the event of Amy in Brazil. Um, 
So it was very mobilized. And here I, I would like to share some partial results for the discussion. The first one is the Black University student movement was and is essential for the implementation and improvement of affirmative actions in Brazil. The second one is after the implementation of racial quotas, there was a significant increase in Black students in these institutions. So the picture of the universities in Brazil changed a lot. The third one is racial quotas allowed Black students to increase their presence in the student movement and to occupy leadership positions, such as the presidents of UNI, as we, we, we saw in the, the last uh, pictures. And the last one is affirmative actions influenced the reconfiguration of the student movement claims, which now include anti-racist agendas. So nowadays it's impossible to, to analyze the student movement without um, um, considering, considering the, the claims for equity related not only to the uh, anti-racist claims, but also feminism, LGBT, etc. So it was very important. And this is a doctoral research that I'm developing, I've been developing in my um, graduate program. And therefore, this presentation only raised part of the partial results of my thesis. So I would like to say thank you for all to see my presentation. My English is a little bit rusty, but, but I, I try to do my best. So thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, there are lots of applauses. Um, certainly, we're we're happy to have you make a presentation. It was wonderful. Um, it was fascinating. And your research about Black university students organizing around their campus is quite essential, as even here in the United States, initiatives like affirmative action, higher education are coming under fire. And we have much to learn from one another, as you suggested um, within your own presentation. And we're fortunate to have you join us. Um, muito obrigada pela presentação sua. And we will now welcome comments, questions, and reflections from the viewing public. So if there are any questions or any curiosities, um, this was an excellent presentation and we're happy to engage with you here. So are there any questions? Please feel free to drop it in the comments or raise your hand to speak directly with our presenter. So we have a question here from our department head, um, Professor Jewell. How would you say that institutional cultures have changed as a result of the movement? So thinking about Black student movements, are institutions themselves changing? We see that the students are changing um, and organizing in these intersectional ways, but how are the institutions responding? Can I answer now? Yes, please, sure. Okay, um, this is a hard question to, to answer, but I will try. So um, I think that um, after the mobilization of the black students at universities, um, the research object object changed a lot, for example, in social sciences. So nowadays it's impossible to analyze the Brazilian culture without um, seeing to the racial inequalities. So um, lots of um, programs, graduate programs, courses nowadays is talking about racism in Brazil. And I, 
I think that the mobilization of black students, for example, in 1993 in the Senu was very important to do it. For example, they try to, to question the idea of a universal um, person in, in, in the science and to, to discuss the epistemology of the universities and the role that black people can do could do in the um, scientific field, for example, um, to, to talk about um, black thoughts in the, the science, social sciences, and the institution changed, for example, in the content of the disciplines and um, related to social sciences or law, for example, but also the universities um, began to implement um, quotas in the higher education after the realization of the, the protests of the black social movement at universities. And for example, was in 2000s that the first university uh, implemented quotas in Brazil. So it was a result of the mobilization of black students in higher education. And I think um, there are lots of effects um, that we can um, attribute to the, the collective actions of the black social movement at universities. One is the, in the, the epistemology and another in the construction of policies that democratize the access of black people of the black population at universities. So um, I think I, I, I answer your questions, your question. Thank you for questioning me. That was an excellent response. Um, this is this is fascinating. Um, one of uh, the comments here asks. To the best of your knowledge, did the rise in Afro-Brazilian students in the university also spark an increase in the other marginalized communities in Brazil? And maybe this is more a question um, asking about that also leads into what might be context building and the kind of demographics of Brazil. And so how is it that universities look and how is it that um, this kind of activism among Afro-Brazilian students, um, how did that possibly inspire other um, communities that are marginalized in Brazil. So if you could speak to just broader demographics of Brazil and also how that compares to university settings so that we can get um, some clarity around that too as you answer this question. This is a, a great question. Um, I think, for example, um, black students in, in, in the universities in 1990s, um, nowadays, they are, for example, repre uh, representatives um, in, um, there are congressmen, for example, Orlando Silva nowadays is a congressman and other um, leaderships in the social movement at universities, black social movement at universities. So these uh, actions in, in the universities fighting for the democratization, equity, um, is spread to our society um, since um, these leaderships passed to occupy um, political positions, for example, not only in the institutional field, but also in the social movement at all. Um, for example, there are leaderships of the MNU, Movimento Negro Unificado, Unified, Unified Black Movement, and it is um, a traditional organization of the Black social movement in Brazil. And I think, um, for example, black people, um, activists, um, is related not only to the black social movement at universities, but they are connected uh, into other organizations like political parties, um, um, social movement related to the feminism and um, other um, organizations. There, there is a, a multi-filiation and like as and Mish said in in her her uh, work academic work, so I think um, the black social movement influenced a lot the other mar 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 marginalized communities in Brazil to to fight against uh, problems that they 
deal with in in the year of routine. So I think it's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And it also seems like the connection between the student movement and um, larger or the Black student movement and the larger political parties of the Workers' Party has had some influence. Um, and so these kinds of political ties external to the university also help to bolster the positioning of marginalized communities in transforming policy. So that is an, an excellent question. Um, Sam has a question uh, about this issue um, and the possible conservative pushback against affirmative action policy in Brazil. So has there been a conservative pushback against affirmative action and programs like it in Brazil as there have been evidence of this in the US recently? So are there is there some resistance to um, transforming universities and their demographics? And what have you observed? Thank you for the question. So in Brazil, um, not only nowadays, but in 1990s and before, um, there are lots of people that fight against um, equality, not only in the higher education, but in the job environment, etc. So the conservatism in Brazil is so strong and we, we saw it when our country elected Bolsonaro to be our president in the last elections. So nowadays, um, fortunately, and we we have um, Lula, our president, current president is Lula, and he's um, more um, how can I say it amenable to the demands of black social movement, but but Bolsonaro uh, doesn't. So um, the con conservative conservatism in Brazil is strong, especially when we talk about the inclusion of black people in the, the places that is not uh, common to see black people like universities or um, receiving good salaries, for example. And nowadays there are um, movements against affirmative actions, but um, we I think the, 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 there is a consensus in, in Brazil um, related to the importance of the affirmative actions. So there are movements fighting, fighting against um, um, affirmative actions in Brazil, but um, I think our society is more, um, how can I say it, is supporting in, 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 in a strong way the, the importance, the relevance of the affirmative actions in our country. Um, some people say that affirmative actions in higher education will be not so good because they, th they think that um, black people um, don't have ability to, to learn faster because of their um, social background um, and um, they don't 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 have um, good good education in in the schools so um, this uh, argument is um, not widespread nowadays in Brazil and there are a consensus related to the importance of affirmative actions but there are some groups that fighting that there is fighting against um, these policies in Brazil. Yes, and maybe it would be um, worthwhile to think about how it is that Brazil, um, like some of our previous um, conversations within this series, um, Brazil has a long history of, as we mentioned before, of a labor movement, of Marxist thinking and thinking in terms of class. And there is still, um, as Roger mentioned, some resistance to directly talking about issues of race because there is the issue or the issue is presented as such that there are uh, there is widespread inequality along issues of class and educational attainment is often the um, portal through which someone who is from a low income background can have a better life. 
But what it is that um, Roger is presenting and showing us with the data that he has and also the kind of qualitative, um, the qualitative information that he's presented is that race still very much structures and orders society in Brazil. And if the two are not understood in this kind of um, interrelated sense, then that still does not um, create equitable conditions um, for, for all Brazilians seeking to enter into the university. Um, so thank you for, for speaking about that. Um, let's see. Oh, someone asked, what is your favorite thing about what you do so far? So I'm thinking that this is leading into the research that you do. Um, what makes it a satisfying experience as a researcher to look at these issues, which can be complicated and, you know, can have their own kinds of, of challenges, but what do you enjoy about what it is that you do um, as a researcher and working on this, this project? Um, I, I'm, re I'm researching this topic um, since I started my BA degree in social sciences from the Federal University of Bahia. And by doing this, I'd like to, to contribute to solve this problem um, because um, there are a lot of on the representation of the presence of black, black students at universities and as professors. So I, I enjoy to learn about the inequalities and by doing my research, I would like to, to, to share the results with um, police, uh, politicians and to people who can change the situation, um, looking for the, the underrepresentation and racial inequality. So I enjoy to, co to be contributing to construct, to, to build um, I have society more inclusive. And more specifically, um, I would like I, I really love to to search on archives, archives and um data sets related to the on the representation of black population, demography, and things like that. And I like to to read um papers, uh, articles, books related to the topic that I'm researching nowadays, not only in Brazil, but also in the United States and other countries. And the most um, thing that I, that I, the, my favorite thing about what I do is to, to search on archives and to do interviews with former leaderships of the black social movement at universities. It's it's very um, impressive to see how they was strong in the context of the the construction of affirmative actions in Brazil because um, nowadays we we see conservatism movements but in 1990s it was strongest comparing to to the the current context so they they were very strong to to fight for the inclusion at universities to build uh, an initiative uh, initiative that is uh, not not common to see in, in brazil and i think that's it um, that i like to to do in my in my research Vision, thank you so much for that that um, comment. Uh, Vision said, I recently read about a law that was passed in 2011, which was intended to reserve 50% of spots in Brazil's university for Afro-Brazilians. What are your thoughts on this initiative? This is a, a great question. Thank you. Um, this law is called Quotas Law. Um, this initiative was approved in 2011. And it was um, a result of the mobilization of the black social movement at universities, um, the mobilization of the civil society in Brazil. It was a discussion about the constitutionality, Jaira. I'm sorry, constitutionality? Constitutionality, yes. Yes, thank you about the constitutionality of the, the quotas in Brazil because 
um, before the 2012, um, the quotas was approved only, were approved only in the universities. But we we doesn't have uh, didn't have a, a law that um, homogenizar um, homogenize homogenize. Thank you. The the policy of affirmative actions quotas at universities. So I think this initiative was. Um, essential to mitigate the, the underrepresentation of black people in Brazil and to institutionalize in the federal field, in the federal perspective, um, the, poli the policy of inclusion, the affirmative policy to include more people, black people, Afro-Brazilians in our country. So thank you so much to, 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 to the question. And this percentage of 15%, um, there are specific quotas for um, black population, but indigenous people and quilombolas in Brazil, as we as we, we said, and to people who don't have much um, much money to how can I say poor people. Um, that have social social problems is related to the this percentage too. So this initiative is very important to the democratization of higher education in Brazil. So thank you. Yes, um, thank you so much, Roger, for pointing that out. And something that I think also bears repeating is that the population of Brazil, over half of the population is of African descent. And so these kinds of measures are designed to um, not only democratize the campus in the, the kind of broad sense of creating uh, systems of equity, but also making sure that the campuses are reflective of the broader population. Um, and so that's where these kinds of numbers end up being interesting. Uh, from the presentation, Hodger mentioned that there was about 2% of um, black students in the 1990s who were in university campuses. So if you think about that, rel in, uh, that percentage only doubled in around 2010. So when you think about those percentages, that really points to the deep disparities in education access in universities. And then you get down to the elite universities and what is the representation there? So these are our questions that are salient for what um, higher education looks like in Brazil and why there are these kinds of um, disparate uh, spreads in demographics in university settings. Brianna asks an interesting question, which points more toward the kind of social dynamics of campuses and universities and identity. And what she asks is, have you ever met Black Brazilians who don't claim their Blackness? I'm speaking to internalized racism because I've heard a lot of Black Latinx who do not consider themselves to be Black? Or are there Black Brazilians who haven't been supportive of affirmative action? So she's asking a question about identity, um, how that may shape one's connection to this broader movement, and are there any complications that you've seen with um, people identifying with the political identity of Blackness? This is a good question. Um, there are not all Afro-Brazilians consider themselves um, Afro-Brazilians because of the myth of racial democracy in Brazil. And there are people who who is Black people, Afro-Brazilian, and disagree um, of the importance of the affirmative actions in Brazil, especially people who is located in the in the the context of the conservatism in Brazil. So we have congressmen who who is a black people and don't support the affirmative actions in Brazil because um, they 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 are not um, they don't part participate in the discussions of the black social movement in Brazil. And maybe some of them are, um, how can I say it in English? Um, 
located are elected by conservatives conservatism parties conservative parties in Brazil and the religion in Brazil um, is very important to the politics so um, in Bahia for example in the city that I'm living nowadays Salvador um, there are lots of representatives black representatives um, related to the um, igrejas evangélicas and evangelical churches evangelical churches that don't don't support the the fighting for equity um at universities because they defend um the merit merito and um so there are lots of people in Brazil that don't support affirmative actions and they are black black persons and the the importance of the black social movement in Brazil is um, very important because um, the activists fight, fight against um, the racial, um, the myth of racial democracy, which means that we, we don't have racism in Brazil. So it's a myth, yes. And um, fight for the, to mobilize more black persons to fight against racism. And this is a, um a, a really good question and there are um conservatism black people um that don't don't support affirmative actions in brazil but um i think that th there are more black persons in the congress and in, in the in the policy in the politics um black people that is related to the the demands of the black social movement so this is a minority uh, um, population of the black, uh, minority percentage of the black population in Brazil that don't support affirmative actions in, in our country. Yeah, that gives us a lot of food for thought, um, especially when we think about this in a comparative context and that there are, of course, um, folks who may not be supportive of affirmative action, um, who could potentially be beneficiaries of it um, in any sort of racialized context. Um, and so to see that this also happens in the context of Brazil, it's not anything that I would say is particularly unique to Brazil, but it is worth considering that there is, as, um, as many of my students have heard in my classes before, um, Black people are not monolithic. And so there are also conservative actions and movements um, against these kinds of um, necessary policy initiatives in the name of merit without acknowledging the kind of structural racism that makes, that creates um, an inordinate amount of barriers to achieve um, a, a college degree. So thank you for that question. It really is helpful um, for us. C. Mason also mentions, um, when talking about diversity of Black populations, the term quilombola um, came up. And so it might be helpful to uh, get our, wrap our minds around the diversity of Black populations in Brazil. So you mentioned that you're from Salvador. That's different from the experience of someone who is from Sao Paulo, who, you know, someone who identifies as a quilombola. So let's talk a little bit about the diversity of Black populations first with a kind of working definition of quilombola. Um, thank you. Um, Quilombola is related to traditional communities. For example, it was on the Quilombos. Um, it's a, a place where um, form, uh, slavery is in Brazil fighting against the slavery system. So uh, nowadays there are some places which um, we, that we, we say uh, territories quilombolas, the quilombolas territories, and these places was an heritage of the fighting against slavery in Brazil, and we we talk about quilombolas when we talk about people who live in places where quilombos exist, and it it is a traditional um communities and 
they they fight for the 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 land rights because um it's not it's not common to see lots of um quilombolas places that have their land rights achieve it so it is a fight for um land rights and these communities is very um very important to see how um diverse is our our country so um thank you for the question i'm not a specialist in researching quilombolas but i i try to to answer your question so thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you roger um we also spoke a little bit last week in our presentations on colombia about palenques and we also think about cimarrones and maroon societies in throughout um, latin america and so these were um, locations and communities and societies that were built um, among Black and Indigenous people to escape the horrors and the brutalities of slavery and create societies of their own um, for a sense of safety, community, and comfort. And these communities exist into today. Um, and again, like the questions of land rights that we spoke about last week are similar um, to what occurs in Brazil. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, one more question. So, wow. Vision says, uh, do you think this avoidance of the Black movement is rooted, or the Black movement for um, Black students in higher education is rooted in racism or the fear of resources being taken away um, from other student populations who have benefited from the system as it has been running? Um, so what do you think there is this kind of resistance to, um, where might the conservative resistance to Black um, students in higher education? Where, what might that stem from? Is it racism? Is it resources that are limited um, and the fear that there, aren't, there isn't enough to go around? What do you think might be behind that? Thank you for the question. And I think both because, um, how can I say, after the, the, the slavery in Brazil, we black people doesn't have access to education they don't had affirmative action in the job in the job field and we we need to to try to solve our problems without an action of the state so um because of that in brazil there are lots of inequalities um, related to the inclusion in the, the education, in the job field, in the politics. So I think the um, conservatives, conservatist people um, don't agree to, to see Black people achieving um, social mobilization and universities are um, a tool to achieve this result. So they think, um, oh, I, I, I will lose my, 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 my space, my place in, in, in universities. And it is related not, uh, to the racism and to the fear to, to, to lose um, the place of the privilege in the universities. So I think it's because of both um, causes in in brazil and um for example it's not common to see in brazil people talking in english because the english courses is so expensive in and in the public schools um we we don't have um quality in the in the lessons of to learn english for example it's not common to see people in brazil doing a phd it's not common to see people, black people, traveling to another country, for example. So, um, I think both causes, and the main cause is the racism, um, the structural racism in Brazil that we we see in the culture, racism in the politics, um, at universities. So it's very very hard to fight against this this system, but we are achieving um, good results recently, like the the Cotas Law and the inclusion of Black population in higher education. So I think 
is related to both causes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. And there's another very interesting question that um, is, is quite provocative. Is there a way that the government is enforcing the reservation of spots in universities? So what is the government involvement in terms of enforcement? And if the universities are not following this law, are there repercussions and punishments for universities in terms of funding? So what are the ways that these um, policies uh, like the um, quotas law, how are they enforced? And what are the consequences if the universities are not upholding their end of the bargain? Good question. Um... The researchers in, in, in Brazil ha have been developing a great job. Um, for example, the GEMA is um, an organization that um, search the implementation of the quotas in, at universities in the federal um, level and state level. So um, I think not only the researchers, but also um, the social movement, black social movement, is very important to to pressure to the implementation of the quotas at universities and to to pressure the government because in Brazil um, we we have a, a political culture um, that we need to pressure the governments to implement the the policies that was approved in in the in the in the past so i think um doing research to analyze if the universities are implementing the the policy and the role that the black social movement develop in the the pressure um of the implementation of the the policy. So I think um, is that there are lots of strategies, and there are people who was um, member of the Black Social Movement in the government fighting for the implementation of the the, the quotas at universities or um, public policies related to equity. So I think um, that there are lots of ways to to pressure for the implementation of the, the public policy in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Are there any other questions or curiosities? Something that might be helpful. Um, oh, yes, go ahead. Um, our head. Professor Jewell, please, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks again for this great presentation. I'm 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 learning so much. Um, I'm wondering about the. Um, there was a story that ran on on national public radio a while ago that I shared with my students about these. Um, I don't know what else to call them except like you know maybe racial determination boards. <laughs> That had emerged where people were claiming, uh, or well, well, people were saying that they were that they uh, were of African descent, but I guess phenotypically you know, they didn't appear that way, and so there was this you know this board sort of report, uh, appointed to kind of make a determination as to a person's ancestry. I'm just curious, given um, you know all of the kind of things you've told us about uh, about political culture in Brazil. I'm just curious about your your thoughts about about this and 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 anything about how it played to the to the public if they use this as as evidence to say see this is why we shouldn't do this sort of thing can i okay thank you professor for the the question um in brazil there are um, two ways to identify if you are um, uh, Afro-Brazilian or no, or don't. Let me see the translation here. Um, 
okay, there are a self a declaration. For example, I feel that my phenotype is uh, black and my, my culture, so I can define myself as a black man in Brazil. But um, there are all other way to identify if I'm black, for example, the hetero identification um, is like a group of persons, um, researchers, uh, members of uh, black social movements that um, analyze your uh, phenotype and do an interview if you try to enter in a public university by university by quotas. And um, in some universities, the uh, university council is implementing policies related to it because of the fraud, fraud. And there are many, many people saying, oh, I'm black, but if you see the phenotype of people is not black, is, um, is white people trying to use uh, the affirmative action to enter in public universities or in in the job, public jobs, for example. So there are two ways to identify if I'm black, the self-identification uh, and the hetero-identification. And it's a very, very um, polemic discussion in Brazil, um, not only in the um, research field, but in the, the social movement. But um, lots of people is um, saying that we need to fight against fraud in the in the the affirmative action in Brazil. So um, there is the two ways, and I think um, these two ways is is good. But we need to think how can we implement it in the in the universities to combat fraud and to guarantee that the affirmative actions um, will be implemented in the future to solve racism in our country and to include more people, black people in, in the universities. Is that, the, I, I answered the question or I, I don't? Uh, yes, yes, you did, sorry, it took me a moment okay. to get there, no, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. And um, maybe something that could be helpful for us to um, think about in the last couple of minutes is if you could tell us about your journey. So you also mentioned that there aren't very many um, Black students in higher education that rise to um, PhD programs that are at um, public universities, which are the um, luminary universities in Brazil. And so you are at a very unique position in your own intellectual trajectory. So what was the university like for you? Um, you always had an interest in looking at racial politics, thinking about affirmative action from this empirical perspective. Was it, um, was it challenging at times? Um, how did you find uh, systems of support for your research? Just speak a little bit about your experience. Were you involved in student movements and activities? So what is your relationship to the research that you have um, and how is it that you've arrived to this point? And we're, we're really glad to have you. Okay, thank you, Jaira. Um, to enter in a public university is not a good task for black students in Brazil because um, I'm the first people in my my family to enter in a public university. I'm the first people in my my family to finish a master's degree and I'm a first person in my my family to enter in a PhD program and I'm a first people in my family to talk in English and, and so um, it's very hard to 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 see our ourselves in this place. For example, my grandma was illiterate, and and she told to my my mom and to me 
that education is a good way to to solve our problems problems that black people are facing and in their daily life so i think um when i enter in the ufba i tried to to research topics that could help my my community <laughs> so because of that i i i started to to study affirmative actions um i studied black social movement at universities and i participated in the the black social movement at universities because um i'm not only a researcher i i try to to solve problems that i'm researching because um we don't have time to to th only think about the problems we need to to fight against these problems so during my ba i i participated in student movement i i did research related to the participation of the black social movement in the universities and during my master's degree and my phd um, i'm trying to interview people because um we don't have lots of documents lots of um, memories uh, about the participation of the the people leaderships so i try to systematize the contribution of these people to the processes of the development of the affirmative action in brazil and it's not it's not easy but we we have um, many friends uh, not only in brazil but um in the united states and we we try to help us to to be to feel comfortable doing the, doing it and try to spread the the opportunities not only for me i i don't i don't want to to be um the first people in my family to be um a, a doctor a phd to achieve a phd but i i try to to share this opportunity for all people uh, all black, black people who want to to achieve this these rights is is all right and you know so um right for education right for um to live in a good a good life so i it's not easy but we we, we are tr i've been trying to 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 solve uh, these prob problems and i feel very happy to to be here talking about not only my research but but also about my trajectory and thank you professor jaira for the the question you are most certainly welcome. We are definitely fortunate to have your presence here. We know um, from our talks already this semester just how um, little transnational dialogue and conversation around these issues are. And so we're happy to have this space and we are so fortunate to have you here. So um, thank you for coming and uh, we appreciate your presence. We will return on Tuesday, October 24th at 3.30 p.m. with presenter Taina Bajo Suarez. And um, this will conclude our conversation for today. So may you all enjoy a great day. Thank you for your work, Roger. Um, and we really appreciate your presence today. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.